All right, well, today, uh, what we're going to do is kind of like our last little lesson um, on sampling distributions. We're going to talk about means again. So we've talked about proportions, which is like percentages, fractions, whatever. And then we've talked about means, averages, like the average weight of the city of Bryan, the average age in Bryan, like whatever it is. Um, and so we're going to do something about the a thing called the central limit theorem. And then we're going to do two samples example. Uh, there is a, so for y'all in person, I gave you the paper on Friday. And then it's due, like you can turn it in today. It's due tomorrow. I guess I'll see you tomorrow. So it's that 7.3 worksheet. And then tomorrow we're going to do a paper here in class, uh, a quit, the little quiz thing, I think, uh, as like a worksheet. And then on Friday, we're going to have like a review. And then Tuesday, it's going to be a test. So Friday, I'm actually going to be out, but I'll have like a key and y'all work through a problem. And then Tuesday, it'll be a little test. All right. Okay, and then we'll move into confidence oh, intervals, yeah. hypothesis testing, null and alternative, which if you've done like biology, you might have talked about oh, null and alternative, null hypothesis, alternative, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you haven't gotten to it yet. Like when you do chi-squared in biology, that's normally when they've talked about it. Um, like AP or I, I don't know when they do it in IB. Maybe it's in IB. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so we are going to, let me just talk about what the central limit theorem is. So it's like an important theorem for statistics. Uh, but first, so if you remember like for, for, the, uh, for the proportions, for the p's, p hats, uh, the sampling distribution. So a sampling distribution is like, there's a population out there, and I'm sampling from that population a sample size of five, 10, whatever. And so we end up like getting like a p hat, and we end up just getting like a bunch of p hats, and they stack up. All these p hats like stack up, and we like it when they become normal and they center around the population parameter. So for p's, the way that you tell that it's normal is by doing n times p, n times 1 minus p, bigger than or equal to 10. That's for proportions. Um, what about for means? So for, for means, it's a little different. There is no like p. You can't do n times p because there is no p. It's an x. So it's like an average. So what we do for this is something called the central limit theorem which, yeah, which we're just going to go through. So I've got this little um, applet, I guess is what it is, uh, that kind of just simulates, it shows like what's happening here. So uh, this is a normal distribution. We're going to use the example that like at the top of your page, it says like ACT scores. Like ACT is, is it zero to 32? I think 32. Huh? 36 now? Okay. Well, um, this is like, let's say this is a population distribution of every single person at Bryan High taking the ACT. And let's say this is my population. So this is like every single person at Bryan High who's, who takes the ACT. Um, and this is what it looks like. It has a normal distribution. And the mean is right here at 16. So like we have an average AT ACT score of 16 and it's normally distributed as the population. So what's our sample going to look like? So what I'm going to do first is down here I'm doing a sample size of 5. So like what happens? I'm going to animate it. Like here's me pulling. Those were 5 random ACT scores with an average of whatever that is. I don't even know. Let's call it like 18, 20, something like that. So 
there's one sample that's an X bar. So if I do a bunch of these, this is a sample size of five. So let me simulate it really quickly. Like here's, I just did five more, five more. Here's 10,000 <laughs> samples of five from our parent population ACT scores. So what you notice is the sampling distribution is normal when the parent distribution is normal. So like if we're pulling from normal data and I do a sample size, it's gonna be normal no matter what. So like it's normal. Uh, what would be, so like down here, I'm gonna do a sample size of 25. What do you think the difference between a sample size of five and the sample size of 25 is gonna be? Okay. So let's do it. So let's do 10,000. I'm just going to quickly do 10,000 samples of 5 and 25. So there's your graph. So the sample size of 5, it's spread out more. And rem remember when your sample size goes up, your spread goes down. Because like you take into account in every sample of 25, you're probably getting high and low. So they just become more centered. So a sample size of 25 is normally distributed just with smaller spread. So like this one has a bigger spread, smaller spread. Okay, so basically if your pop parent population is normal, then you can take whatever sample size you want and the sampling is going to be normal. What happens if it's skewed? So let me do like skewed data. So let's say we're... Um, you know, let's do a parent population of like uh, ACT scores of IB AP students at high schools. And they look like this because, you know, I'm trying to encourage y'all that y'all are so smart. So like uh, the average ACT score of like people who take AP and IB classes is over here at 22. Like it's a it's skewed to the right. Like y'all's parent population is much higher. So what's going to happen with the uh, sampling distribution of 5 versus 25? So let me do just the 5 first. So I'm going to do a sample size. Oops, I wanted to animate it. All right, so you can see when I did like a sample size of 5, I got a couple of these low ones, a couple over here, and one right here, and it dropped. So if I did another one, wow, so I got two way over here. A couple over here one and like so the so the spread is like really big let me do 10,000 really quick so I've just done like a bunch of samples from this students who are AP IB taking the ACT and what do we notice about a sample size of five is that it still kind of has this skew to the left. Like there's kind of a tail over here. It's not perfectly symmetric, which I think I could even put, like this would be if it's a normal distribution, but it's kind of skewed. Like it's, it's high over here and then it tails. So if I did a sample size of five and my parent data is skewed or I don't know it. So if I don't know the parent distribution, I have to assume that it's not normal. Like I have no idea what the distribution of heights of people in Bryan is. I don't know if the parent distribution is like, the population is like skewed or whatever. Uh, and so if I only did a sample size of five, it stays skewed because when I draw a sample, sometimes I get these like low numbers out here. Sometimes you don't, but sometimes you do. Okay, so what if I did a sample size of 25 compared? So let me just do it like 10,000. So here's a bunch of samples. The sample size of 5 is still skewed to the left, just like the population. But if I did a sample size of 25, you can see that it's, it's much more symmetric and like normal. Like there's not really they're pretty even, like here's the middle, side, side, like it's pretty normal distributed. So the bigger the sample size, 
on an unknown, let's say we didn't know this population up here, if I take a big enough sample, the distribution of those samples will be normal. So that's what the central limit theorem is. It says if I take a big enough sample, then it doesn't matter what the population is, my distribution will be normal. So that's kind of the idea here is that um, I don't want to take a small sample. So if I take really small samples, like this is a sample size of two now. A sample size of two was really skewed. Sample size of 25, normal. So if you take a big enough sample, your sampling distribution will be normal is basically the idea. So uh, on the back side, if you want to put this in important ideas, area, whatever, we're going to kind of just do the check your understanding part. Uh, and then, okay, so, so let me put it this way. So, uh, so basically, so this is the central limit theorem over here. So what it says is if your sample size, so if n is large enough, and so in statistics, uh, large enough people, I guess, have just like come to the conclusion for AP stats that came with just a number. So what we have for this is large enough is a sample size of 30. That's like guaranteed no matter how skewed, how wonky the population is, that's large enough. So if the sample size is large enough, the sample sampling distribution um, of your x bar will be normal or I guess I should say approximately normal um, and that's for like any population for skewed or whatever. So if your sample size is large enough, n equals 30, which on that thing we did n equals 25 and it was pretty normal. So whatever, but they've come up with 30. Like 30 is safe. So if you do at least n equals 30. So if I have a sample size that, that's big enough, the sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal basically no matter what the population distribution is. So what this is is like, so this is important for skewed population or unknown populations. Like what if you don't know the population distribution? So skewed population, or unknown population. So like if I have no idea what the distribution looks like for the average ACT score of the city of Bryan College Station, which I would have no idea what that looks like, um, which that might be skewed because there's a lot of kids at A&M and like, I'm sure their ACT scores were decent. So um, who knows what that population looks like. Uh, if, if I take a big enough sample, then I know that that distribution of all those samples, like the infinite amount of samples of 30, I know that that will be normal. And I can do the z-score and all that good stuff. So like if you were to ask 30 people? Yeah, so like if I'm gonna, whatever, I'm gonna go take a survey of people like I want to make sure that when I can interpret the data that so I need to go back and make sure I'm doing at least a simple random sample of 30 and doing that over and over like another sample of 30 another sample of 30 whatever at least because um, that will help me ensure normal now if I know like Brian High I could probably find the population distribution of Brian High because like Someone somewhere has information on y'all. Like they have your data, whatever. Uh, it's in a computer. But like, um, 
If I don't know, then we want to be safe and we want to do big enough samples. So this is again, this is, if I go back, this is for means. For the, for the proportions, we just do this, like you have that for proportions. But for means, you have to have a big enough sample size. Uh, if, though, uh, I guess an important thing, if the, if it says the population is normal distributed, then it doesn't matter. So like if it says, like let's assume that the population distribution is normal, then you're good. It doesn't matter your sample size then. Um, so we'll get to an example here. Yeah, like on our second one. Okay. Let's do some problems and just get me some problems under you. Just want to try and do as many examples that it becomes easier. Okay. Among this is the one on your page, right? Yeah. Okay. Because it screwed up last week. Uh, among iPhone users who share data with Apple, the weekly screen time is skewed to the right with a mean of 13 hours, standard deviation 3.75. So, uh, <coughs> that's pretty low. A mean for the week. Oh, for the week? That's for the week. I was thinking per day. So that's like. So that's what it always says to me that it's like your screen drops down like 6% or whatever. Yeah. So that's why it's skewed to the right because all of the teenagers are way over here. Over here, way yeah. high. Uh, okay. So it's skewed to the right. Uh, a random sample. So that's our mean and our standard deviation because Apple knows this about, like they have all the information so they can make a parent distribution. Okay, what if we took a random sample of 100 iPhone users and got the average weekly screen time? Okay, so we're doing a sample size of 100. Um, describe the shape of the sampling distribution of X bar for samples of 100, justify your answer. It should be approximately normal, right? Yeah, and so what you can say, you can say it's approximately normal because your sample size is large enough, or you can say sample greater than 30%. Let's just go ahead and say that. So approximately normal because sample size large enough. Or if you don't want to say that, you could have just said because n equals 100, which is greater than 30, basically. Like we have a big enough sample. Um, which is, again, like the word for that. Because sometimes, uh, like a multiple choice question could be like, describe to me what the central limit theorem says. So. I'll just write that out again. So like this is, if it says it, it's just saying like we want our sample size to be large enough so that we know that our sample distribution is normal. So that's what we've got here. But you could just say it's normal because the sample size is large enough. Like we've got taking good samples. Okay, find the mean and the standard deviation of x bar do the sample and distribution so what is the mean of all of the possible x bars of sample size 100 so what's our formula say yeah the mean of all the x bars just equals the population mean or the assumed population mean which in this case 13 and a half hours. Okay, and then the standard deviation of the sample means of the X bars is, I think the formula sheet says, do your population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So like, we're gonna get smaller. When I increase sample size, our standard deviation goes down. So that's why we're dividing, it's, it's decreasing. So that would be 
3.75, because you've got standard deviation, 3.75, divided by the square root of 100. What's that? Square root of 100? Yeah, square root of 100, which is just 10. So then that's like 0.375. Go like a decimal over when you yeah. divide by 10. Or just do it in a calculator, either way. So that should become <coughs> the new standard, the standard deviation of all of the sample means is at 0.375. Um, when it asks for the 10% condition, what does that mean? Yeah, our sample size is less than, is your sample size less than 10% population? So, is 100 iPhone users less than all of the world's iPhone users? Yes. Probably, yeah. So, 100 is definitely less than 10% of iPhones. There's definitely more than a thousand iPhones. Probably that many in this school right now. It's scary to think about. Apple controlling the world, along with Amazon and Google. Love my dictators. Because they're listening right now. Anyways, okay. All right, got those. Okay, let's do the problem then on C. Calculate the probability that the weekly screen time is between 12 and 13 hours. All right, so we've said I have this distribution, have a normal distribution. We said that the average is at 13.5. Let's see, 12 to 13. What percent is within that exact little range right there? What's the probability, what's the percent chance of that happening? <coughs> so when you're doing a range, we have to do z-score for both of them. So do a z-score for the 12, so 12 minus Average divided by standard deviation. Uh, so, yeah. So, it did say for the sample. So, that's what that was our use the sample distribution. So, that's kind of the tricky thing. With some of these means, sometimes it just asks you for like a sample of one. But if it asks you for the sample of 100, then we're going to use the standard deviation we just calculated. Uh, so I'm pretty sure there had to be decimals, right? But I got negative four. Was it just straight negative four? Okay. Interesting. So a z score of negative four. So like way out there, negative four. And then let's do the z score for 13, and then we'll look at the chart. So 13 minus 13.5. So negative 0.5 divided by 0.375 is negative 1.33. And so let's look at, yeah, yeah. So let's look at what that means. So let me just pull it up. So it's like 3.4 is like the lowest it goes to, right? Like negative 3.49, let me yeah. see. So you look up your z-score, negative 3.49 is the lowest, and it is at 0 .002, so basically zero. And so I need to go another, like this is only at basically 3.5, I need to go another 0.5 so with, if we're that far out, like let's just go ahead and call this, like this just becomes 
zero. Like there's no chance that it goes that far, is what that means. Point zero, it's definitely less than point zero zero two. <coughs> so it's, at that point, it's basically zero. Because it's, it's probably point zero 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 one. This is nothing. Okay, and then I guess let's look up the value for negative 1.33. So negative 1.33 is 0 0.0918, 0 0.09. All right. Let's just go back to negative 4 real quick. So that because it was so far away from negative 3.49, we can just call it 0. If we were doing like negative 3.49, Six, then maybe you could say like 0 0.001, but that's basically zero. So those are our two numbers, which is both of those are the numbers that are less than less than those values. So what's the range in between them? Is you just subtract them, but since it's zero, the subtraction of it is just that. 9% number, 0 0.918. So my picture is kind of off with how far I put 12. 12 should really be like, just like way over here in nothing land. Um, okay, so the reason it's only 9% is because like, the standard deviation got so small because our sample size was so high, like the standard deviation shrunk so much. So that's why like just being a minute past the mean, when you do a sample size that's so big, the spread just is so tight there, like it, just, it gives you, which is good, it gives you more accurate data for that sample, but just like that's what's happening there. Why it's such a small percentage. Okay, so that's one sample. It they they're working the same way as proportions, except instead of doing a bunch of decimals, so like proportions, I would have like forty percent minus thirty percent, point four minus point three. Uh, instead, we're just doing more means, but you're still doing z scores, still trying to make it normal distributions, using the formulas over here. So it all still kind of works out the same. Okay, let's do one. Let's do the other paper, uh, and we're gonna do two samples, and then we'll kind of be done. Okay, so let's try try this out for two samples. Uh, so up at the top, it says ACT scores at Ardry Cal High School are normally distributed with mean of 26, standard deviation three. So this is saying like the, the population is normal. So like that means we can do whatever sample size we want. And then, the ACT, so ACT scores at Providence High School are skewed to the right with a mean of 25, standard deviation 5. So the population is skewed on that. basically just checking off each of those individually, but then number two is putting them together. So I'm just gonna do number two, and we're gonna put them all together at the same time. So instead of doing them individually, so I'm kind of skipping over number one. So number two, suppose that we took a sample of 25 from AKHS, and we did a sample of 30 from Providence. Uh, what is the difference in the sample means? So what is the difference between AKHS minus PHS? So what is the 
mean, standard deviation, and shape. So if you look at the formula, if you look at the formula sheet, maybe I'll just write it down for those that are online. So on the formula it says for two populations, which that's what we're dealing with. We have two populations here. It says, I'll just write it down like I see it. It says you do the mean minus the mean. So the population mean minus the other population mean uh, is how you get the difference in the means. So in this case, they wanted us to do AK minus P minus <coughs> or whatever. So I had a mean of 26 and a mean of 25. So if we if we did many, many samples from AKHS, many, many samples from PHS, these would be the means. So when I do many, many samples of the difference between them, we would expect one. a positive one to AKHS. That's just what we would expect, but obviously PHS could have more, like there could be PHS kids that have a higher ACP average. But we expect this over many, many trials. It comes to the long-term frequency thing. Like over many trials, that's what we expect. Formula sheet, standard deviation, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. It says to do this, so standard deviation of 1 squared over n1 plus standard deviation of 2 squared over sample size of the second population. So just following, following our samples that we got, following our formulas, knowing how to read them, knowing where to look too, like, oh, understanding these symbols and being confident in where you put the stuff. So the square root of, so for one in this case, that's going to be AKHS. So that is three squared over, their sample size was 25. Plus, uh, where's that? Five squared over a sample size of 30. So just not making mistakes, putting in three with 25, five with 30. Like these are different numbers because they're different sample sizes. Just taking your time. I know there's little mistakes that happen. Uh, that's kind of where something can go wrong. Okay, and then use your calculator, or do it by hand if you want, but calculator, the inspires are kind of nice in this case, because they have that little fraction button that yeah. you can just put in there. So you put it in, type it out, and it's like, at least I got 1.09 for the standard deviation. And then that's your mean. So we expect AKHS to be 1, but the standard deviation, a typical range, is plus or minus 1, is where a lot of those values are. So a typical varying number between them is 1, plus 1, minus 1. Okay, and then let's talk about the shape. So we're, we're just trying to see, is it normal? And so kind of take it one at a time. So like for the shape, like if both of them are normal, then the difference between them is normal too. So let's just prove that both of these are normal. So I'm gonna just do one for AK and one for P high school. So why is Ardry Kell High School 
Why is the sampling distribution normal on this one? For, For the AK. Because, yeah, because the population is normal, so our sample is normal. So you can say that it's, so you can say normal because pop is normal. So that's weird. That's Pop is the grandpa name for my wife's dad. <laughs> so Pop, uh, yeah, population is normal. So that one's normal because the population is normal. And then uh, Providence is normal because it's too big. Sample size is big enough. So uh, you can say normal because sample size of 30 is greater than or equal to 30. Central limit theorem, CLT. Like the central limit theorem tells me if I have a big enough sample, then I'm good. And some random people, who knows how many years ago, decided 30 was a good number. Who knows why? They did. Thirty and thirty. So just it's really the same process. We're just doubling up. So mean, standard deviation, and then prove both are normal with the shape. So you just double everything up, and then number three, calculate the probability, or it could ask like, what's the percent chance of this happening? Whatever. Uh, what's the probability that a random sample of 25 is ha has a higher mean ACT score than a random sample of 30? So like given what we just did with those means and standard deviations, what's the probability that basically it's saying that AKHS is greater than PHS? Right? Yeah, that's what it's saying. What's the probability that AKHS is bigger than PHS. So in context of this subtraction business, what would that mean? So like, because what we put it in is we did this. So like, what's what are these numbers here if we want this to be higher than this one? What, what values are we looking for in the subtraction? Like when I, if I want AKHS to be bigger than PHS, when I subtract them, all these numbers are going to be positive numbers. So like when I do, when I do the subtraction, I'm looking at, are these numbers positive? Like let me draw the picture and then it'll make sense more. So I've got a mean of one and if it's asking this question it's basically asking what's the probability there's the zero number so that they're even what's the probability of all the things where AKHS is bigger so where all those numbers are positive Put, put in like, when it asks you a question like, okay, if I had this as 26 and this as 24, this would be a positive two. So like, I'm always looking for the positive numbers in my picture, whatever. So just getting the question, understanding the question's asking. Could be another tricky part. I'm trying to look at the back side, see if it's Okay. So let's do, so like then at this point, we've done all the work and now we just need to finish it off with like getting the z-score. So value minus mean divided by standard deviation. So negative 
And so it is important because like there's different numbers. So this last number is like important. The difference between nine one and nine three, nine two are all different. So it's important to get that. Then you look this up in the table. Look up that value. Two point one seven eight eight. Right. And then that is always a value less than. And so we weren't really asking the less than point, we were asking the greater than, so you do one minus it. end up with like 82% of the time we would expect AKHS to be higher than the other one. So just being diligent about like where your numbers are going. Uh, the formula sheet is just once you understand what all those symbols mean, it's just kind of process of like going through it and it's just a, a motion of doing it, but you just get comfortable with which formulas you're using. Um, the Z table is the same way. It's just once you get in this process, it becomes easier once you do a few times. So uh, again, what this means, I guess, is like 82% of the time, a sample of 25 AKHS scores is going to be higher than a sample of 30 GHS. So that's for the difference, the difference between them. Right. And so we're going to do a lot more of the differences when we do uh, central, or not central, uh, when we do confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. So I'm just going to kind of leave it at that for this unit, for the two sample stuff. So just kind of introducing it to you, seeing it. So we're going to stop there on the day and with the rest of our time, you've got that worksheet that I gave you on Friday. So you can get that in. Uh, you can work on that. I guess your your II or IV. E. Your, no, II. Uh, IA. 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 Whoa. Whoa. Is that something else? <laughs> yeah. What's an IA? Uh, it's, it's like, like shorter baby. Integrated assessment. Internal. Internal. Yeah. Mm. Internal. Close. Okay. You have to do it forever. Right, we'll work on that if you need to. Whatever you need to do, but yeah.